Um, my name is Carlton Fowler. I am the son of Carlton's eldest daughter, Twyla Lofgren Fowler. And because I am named after him, I wanted to come up here to say goodbye. <clears throat> my grandfather, or Grampy, as all the grandchildren called him, was what I call a patient perfectionist. I want to take a minute to explain what that means. I have met many patient men, and I have met many perfectionists. And I can tell you those two things don't often mix too well. But in Grampy, they found a pretty perfect harmony. He was a profound man of faith and a loving man of family. He knew it was right, and he loved his family so much that he wanted to help them be the best that they could possibly be. And this often resulted in what my mother, aunt, and uncle, and the grandchildren might affectionately call the lectures. <clears throat> there was a lecture about safely operating power tools. I affectionately called it lecture number 37. It never changed. There was a lecture about how to drive a tractor, which you had to do, all cousins, before learning to drive a Jeep, and only then could you attempt a car. Grampy was YouTube before there was YouTube. It is hard to fully put into words the perspective of a 10-year-old boy who was convinced that his grandfather knew, quite literally, everything. And frankly, as I got older, there was no reason not to keep believing that as the evidence consistently mounted. To Carl, there was a right way to do things. And, well, as no one would possibly dispute that, Grampy knew best. Gosh darn it, that would be the way he would teach it. Always patiently, but always thoroughly. It was his way of saying, I love you so much, I want to teach you the best way to do things. And if you didn't hear it the first time, he was happy to start again from the top. I say all of this because I think one of the most enduring lectures was the homework lecture, as my mom calls it, lecture number eight. He expected everyone to do all the homework because that was picking up the free points. Only my grampy would consider getting 100% scores on homework as the free points. Then on top of that, you could and should shoot for extra credit. <clears throat> I say this because following the standard way for a life sketch was my homework, and I want to make sure I get all the free points. Only then can I get to the extra credit. And few people in this world encouraged my voracious need for extra credit more than my grandfather. Spoiler alert, it will involve sword fights with real swords, as well as children hurling rotten fruit at each other, all with Grampy's express permission. Carlton Lofgren was the youngest of four children, born on November 22nd, 1933, in Spokane, Washington. And I'm actually just realizing, I bet 112233 was the combination to a lot of things. <clears throat> well, more on that later. <clears throat> he was born to John Alex Lofgren, a woodshop teacher in Adventist Academies, and Ruth McGovern Lofgren, an elementary school teacher. His mother knew early on that his life would be dedicated to Christ. He experienced a serious illness as a child that was potentially mortal, but through the power of prayer from his family and others, he was spared to lead his remarkable life. He attended Loma Linda Academy, where he met and romanced Ray McAnally. If you'll allow me a story, Carl approached Ray one day and said, I bet you a quarter I can kiss you without touching you. He then proceeded to hand her a quarter and took his kiss. He married his high school sweetheart in 1954, and their loving relationship lasted more than 68 years. While Carl was attending La Sierra College and Loma Linda University Dental School, three children joined the family, Twyla Ray, Carla Lee, and Bradley Richard. Carl graduated dental school in 1961 and began his practice, specializing in restorative dentistry. Others today will highlight the breadth and depth of his contributions to the university and community, but take it from the son of a dental surgeon, the level of work that Carl did as a dentist was up to his normal standard, meaning perfection. I've had dentists to this day go out of their way to tell me that the inlays he did for Twyla are the best they've seen 56 years later. Although he loved dentistry, he was called to business and management. 
1971, Carl was offered a position with McAnally Enterprises, a large multi-state family-owned egg producing company. He was named president of that company in 1991. He was fondly referred to as the chicken dentist. Carl also served on the board of directors for the American Egg Board for 12 years, two of those as president. He was named Egg Producer of the Year in 2000. I cannot stress enough the effect visiting Grampy at his office had on me at a young age. I didn't know exactly what was happening in those wood-lined boardrooms or that con con cavernous office, but I knew important decisions were being made and I wanted to be just like him someday. Now that I'm sitting on my own multiple boards of directors, I wish more than anything I could sit down and ask him for much needed advice. My grandfather had hobbies in the singular way only he could. A one-man Navy and Army, he was a sailing and jeeping enthusiast. He loved to be on the water, and because we are talking about Carlton Lofgren, that does not mean a pleasure cruise in the bay. He frequently sailed his 38-foot down easter to Catalina with his family, and once sailed it all the way on the 2,500-mile journey to Hawaii, my Uncle Rick. And I believe Grammy was prohibited from calling the Coast Guard because there was a hurricane, and you all wonder where the Fowler boys get their risk-taking behavior. He also had a love of jeeping. Now, most people who love jeeping might like to go out for the day and maybe even do a little rock climbing. Not Carl. He rebuilt a 1942 military World War II Willys Jeep. It was perfectly stock, and he would constantly search for the correct accessories, time period appropriate, of course. But this was no showpiece. Grampy went over the hardest Jeep trail in the US, the Rubicon, multiple times with this stock Jeep. Over climbs so dangerous, they were named things like Heart Attack Hill. Grampy and the rest of us were forced to get out and walk for our safety, but Grampy conquered those climbs with nothing but skill and a tiny inline four-cylinder engine. Now, after properly finishing my life sketch homework, I can get to the extra credit. I wanted to find the best way to describe to you, all of you, the impact that Grampy had on my life and others' lives, and struggled to find the right metaphor. There is so much he meant and so much he gave that it was staggering trying to condense it onto paper. In the end, it was simple and sitting right in front of me. Forgot to turn that around, but 5800 Hoarden, the big house. I'm sure all my cousins will agree that magical and beautiful place evokes and conveys the very essence of Carlton Lofgren. Carl and Ray and the kids moved into the big house in 1968. That made my mom about 12, Carl about 10, and Uncle Rick around eight. Those ages are important because to me, when I think about my grandfather in that place, I am permanently a 12-year-old boy who got to play with his cousins in a literal castle. The finished article of the big house is replete with winding staircases, grand living rooms, libraries with chess sets and suits of armor, secret tower rooms, full basements with every woodworking tool you could imagine, and lecture number 38. And most importantly, a ceiling to floor length bank vault door with a giant combination lock. Catnip for someone like me, and I'm now realizing the combination was probably 1-1, 2-2, 3-3. <laughs> but the big house was not always thus. In fact, when Grampy and family first moved in, it was a work in progress. A huge blank canvas ready to be the recipient of more than 40 years of improvement and upkeep that would make it the refuge I would come to know and love. That is why that place will re forever represent my grandfather in my mind. There was nothing he couldn't fix or build or improve. And that house was his magnum opus as well as a living lesson to his family of the rewards of hard and diligent work. Let's start with the trees. Grampy loved trees. While the lush paradise of, paradise of landscaping and orchards were to come later, it started with a Christmas tree farm. That's right, Grampy and his children tried to build a Christmas tree farm and never once sold a single tree. I'm going to assume probably because they were all trimmed within an inch of their life. <laughs> but that is not the end of the tree saga. Next up, 
and only after many furtive consultations with the agricultural specialists at UC Riverside and a custom-built irrigation and fertilization system only he could conceive, Grampy planted his green gold. These avocado orchards would become so productive that he would sell the excess to a co-op, but not before having every guest leave with an armful as a parting gift. To Grampy, these orchards were a point of pride. To me and the cousins, they were backdrop to a thousand games of hide and seek. Next up were the fruit, the fruit orchards, a perfectly terraced hillside that separated grapefruits from oranges, from tangelos, and all the way down to kumquats. That wonderful fruit became the base to the most prized job in preparation for the big family Sunday breakfasts. Operating the big electric juicer to make the pitchers of fresh squeezed orange juice that Grampy affectionately called his battery acid. There was, of course, one other use for the orchards, the fruit wars between the cousins. There was only one rule laid down by Carlton. You could only launch fruit that had fallen on the ground. Of course, there was grampy wisdom in that a rotten grapefruit thrown 40 yards like an acidic missile is an uncomfortably slimy but not altogether too painful an experience. Still ripening grapefruit upside the head, thrown with laser accuracy, at who was at that time the baby of the cousins, my little brother, was an altogether consciousness depleting event. Once again, Grampy knew best. That house was the home to so many events. Yearly Fourth of July barbecues, weddings, and church and university functions. It was the it house where all of his grandchildren, where all of his children's friends school friends gathered as they grew up, and it was the staging grounds for every grandchild's yearly special time, where they got Grammy and Grampy all to themselves. It was simply a both steady and magical place, built by a steady and magical man that helped define who I am today and provides me with some of my fondest memories. <clears throat> there is one act that I think sums up exactly what my grandfather wanted us to understand about duty and habit and doing things the right way. Every day he would climb to the four-story tower room and go out on the roof and raise the flag. And every day he would take that flag down and carefully fold it. Because every castle must have a flag and every castle must have a king watching over it. My grandfather might be gone, but the lessons he taught me and everyone else here will never leave us. His legacy of love and family and teaching is enduring. And thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>